most of you won't realise that uh, nuclear medicine uh, never started with imaging. It started with therapy. It's kind of incredible to think, isn't it, that before we had imaging, we had therapy. Uh, it started with uh, Marie Curie and Pierre Curie, uh, that Pierre got a sample of, of radium which he put in his upper pocket uh, and took off to the Sorbonne to show his physics student. He got a burn on his skin and he said, oh, this is nasty. And he t went and saw a friend of his who worked at the uh, Salpetrier Hospital in, in Paris who was a dermatologist, and he said, this would be a really good treatment for skin cancer. And he started doing it. We didn't have the FDA or TGA or anything then, so <laughs> he just went and did it. And uh, uh, this was in um, uh, 1905. Uh, he did it, and within uh, five years of that, it was at St Vincent's Hospital here in Melbourne. People were being treated with radium. And uh, then uh, the cyclotron uh, was first um, uh, made at the University of, uh, of California in um, uh, uh, one of the universities of California in Berkeley. And uh, uh, Ernest Lawrence um, uh, started making radioactive isotopes with, with a cyclotron. One of them was P32, uh, which uh, he thought would go into blood. And his brother was a haematologist, and they were doing studies of the circulation of blood. Uh, a guy called Bloomfeld looked at the circulation through the heart and noticed that some of the patients were becoming anemic. And he mentioned this to his brother, and he said, this would be a good treatment for, for, for blood cancer. And uh, he uh, uh, then treated a medical student. Medical students are great guinea pigs. And uh, with chronic my myeloid leukaemia, and this was the first effective treatment for leukaemia. So radioisotopes beat uh, uh, chemotherapy in uh, the nitrogen mustards uh, in, into the treatment. Uh, but one of the really revolutionary and still the most remarkable aspects of nuclear medicine therapy is the treatment of thyroid cancer. This was the beginning of what we call theranostics, the ability to see and then treat. And we're very privileged uh, today to have Barbara Hertz, who's the uh, daughter of one of those pioneers uh, who made an observation that iodine was used to make thyroid hormone, would go to the thyroid gland. And they used to use Geiger Muller counters, you know, to, to, you know, you see them in the movies, the click, 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 click machines. And they, they put it up on the thyroid gland and found that radioactive iodine, and I was fortunate enough, 1996 was a momentous year for me, I made a CD of the history of nuclear medicine. Most people don't know that. So I do know the, <laughs> the history of nuclear medicine. And I met Glenn Seaborg, who, who was the first person to make in a cyclotron uh, iodine-132, not 1931, was the first isotope he made. And that led um, Barbara's father to think about using this for the treatment of overactivity of the thyroid gland. <coughs> and also for the treatment of thyroid cancer. And uh, her father and another uh, physician called Sam Seedlin uh, uh, administered this to, to thyroid cancer patients and they used a Geiger-Muller counter, sat in the room and measured every metastasis before they had imaging. And so this is really the start of therapeutic nuclear medicine and theranostics. And so it's really, uh, when uh, we heard that uh, Barbara was keen to come, we thought you'd love to hear the story of her father's uh, discovery and insights. Thank you so much. Um, let me give you a little background about my dad. Uh, he was one of seven boys. Go grandma and grandpa. Uh, and he came, um, my grandparents came from Europe uh, in the late 1800s in that um, they were, came to U.S. to escape persecution. And um, they started their family in Cleveland, Ohio. And um, my father was one of seven boys. This, I believe he was the second uh, in line. Um, he grew up as an Orthodox Jew. And he had restrictions when it came to coming to colleges in that um, he attended your alma mater, <coughs> University of Michigan. Um, in that uh, Jews and Catholics were not uh, welcome, should we say, at Ivy League schools. However, uh, he did very well at U of Michigan. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa. And um, at Harvard Medical School, they had restrictions. They had what they call quotas. And he was one of a very limited amount of outsiders who attended and graduated from Harvard Medical School. 
Um, I'm giving you a bit of the background here in terms of his um, challenges because as he went on to um, utilize the radioactive iodine, and it is the first targeted cancer therapy, um, I believe it's called the gold standard. Would that be correct? Um, you can appreciate the challenges that he had, and I hope that it will be inspiration to you as clinicians and, and patients to realize that you just have to put one foot in front of the other and keep on going. Okay, that brings him to his internship and residency, which he did back in Cleveland at the Mount Sinai Hospital, and he had a great interest in thyroidology. He came back to Boston, I might note as a volunteer, at the Mass General Hospital, where they had established a thyroid unit in 1920. And one of the eminent thyroidologists of the time was Dr. James Means, and at which point um, Dr. Means also became the chief of medicine at Mass General. And he was very pleased to have my father there. He was a pretty open-minded guy in that he also, um, about five years after my dad was welcomed aboard, he welcomed a woman to the staff. Uh, not officially on staff, I might add. My dad did come as a volunteer and he wasn't paid until um, there was uh, foundation money. But he and um, Dr. Means found themselves at uh, a luncheon meeting, very similar to what you all just had, um, at um, Vanderbilt Hall, which was the dormitory of Harvard Medical School. And it's hard for you to see this, but you can imagine how the room was about this size, because I've actually been in it. But the entire faculty of um, the teaching staff of uh, Harvard Medical School uh, was in this dining room listening to a lecture on November 12th, 1936, mind you, that's before the atomic bomb, and it's before the cyclotron, I believe, out at Berkeley as well, with President Carl Compton, and I might note, Carl Compton was one of the brothers, because there's something called the Compton, Compton Scatter, okay. So, um, going along with the brother theme here, um, Dad was there to listen to President Compton speak what physics can do for biology and medicine. 1936 was really pretty close to the Curies and the time, well, Marie, one of the Curies. Uh, Murray was still working. Okay, so he, um, my dad had already been working with iodine, and he knew that the iodine was taken up by the thyroid gland. So he spontaneously posed the question, um, and the question was, could iodine be made radioactive artificially? And from that one seminal question came a huge breakthrough discovery. In fact, it could be made. Um, I don't know all the particulars here, but Dad writes back and he says he hopes that it will be a useful method of therapy. I guess that worked out pretty well. Um, Things went along. They got money from um, one, of the found, uh, one of the funds at Harvard Medical School. And in my dad's notebook, he makes note of uh, experiment number one, what the purpose was, and the little rabbits that he had counted off. He had, he had uh, done something, something to the thyroid gland. Uh, anyway. Um, they hired this uh, doctor, physicist at MIT. His name is Arthur Roberts. And I might note that he was also of the same background as my dad. And when he was hired as a condition of his employment, his uh, supervisor, the head of the uh, radiation lab, Dr. Uh, Robley Evans, made sure that if anything was written and published, that Robley Evans' name would be on the paper. And um, Dr. Roberts didn't have a problem with that because he assumed that Dr. Evans would do some of the work. Um, it didn't exactly turn out that way, but at any rate, the experiment was a um, very important one with these rabbits. 
And what they did is they made the I-128 without a cyclotron based on Fermi's work. And they found that the, um, it demonstrated the principle of the tracer uh, ability of a nuclear substance to trace the functioning of a, an organ. Um, the radioactive iodine was administered to rabbits with altered thyroid gland function. A quantitative analysis showed that hyperplastic thyroid glands retain more radioactive iodine than normal thyroid glands. And so we are launched into um, evaluating um, internal organs with a nuclear medicine, a nuclear substance. Um, as time went on, um, they went to write up the paper on the rabbit studies. And guess what happened? Robley Evans heard that the, publish, the paper was going to be published. So what he did, he had done no work on it, by the way. So uh, he called my dad over to MIT, sat him down at the old clickety-clank typewriter with the carbon paper. He dictated a letter so that Robley Evans' name would be put on the manuscript, although he had done no work. That kind of set the foundation of the relationship <laughs> between Robley Evans, Arthur Roberts, who was working for him, and Saul Hertz. Um, as I've come to understand Dr. Evans, he would make Donald Trump look like a saint. <laughs> so um, this is kind of the one of the underlying challenges that he had um, in that um, he went forward, they got money from a foundation, they got $30,000 to build a cyclotron at MIT. That was quite a deal, don't you think? Um, and in doing so, they generated the radioiodine and they um, administered the first treatment to Elizabeth D. Um, in the early part of 1941. And this a sweet lady had 2.1 millicaries, which doesn't seem like a whole lot, but in fact, um, they didn't want to kill her, I guess. <laughs> and they followed it up with something called the Lugol solution, which is a stable iodine. Okay, I guess in terms of there's something that happens to you if your thyroid isn't functioning properly, it's called the thyroid storm. And they wanted to prevent um, this woman going, having a thyroid storm in case the radioactive iodine didn't work. OK. So they developed a series of 29 uh, patients. And then we have a problem, World War II. And um, Dad went into the Navy and served as an adjunct to what became the um, Manhattan Project. And um, when he came back from serving his country, lo and behold, the doctor, Earl Chapman, who had taken over the cases, had gone to publish my dad's work as his own. Uh, it was not a pretty picture. And for anyone who's in medicine or anyone who has a job who's worked more than a month, you know what in institutional politics is like. However, this was beyond the institutional politics. This was a matter of big egos, and also it was hard to sort out the racism of the time. So he tried desperately to resolve the situation, and the Journal of the American Medical Association ended up printing two articles from the same hospital, side by side, in the same journal, using the same treatment, showing the same effect. However, um, as he was um, writing to the human resource person at Mass General, he wrote, um, I have certain ideas in the field of cancer of thyroid, which are even more intriguing from a physician's point of view. Uh, what he wanted to do is go forward utilizing the radioiodine for treating thyroid cancer. And he felt at that time, and is described in the same letter, that he believed that the tracer method would hold promise for other types of cancer. And no pun intended, but he was right on target. <laughs> so um, he, after the war, he went to the Beth Israel Hospital, 
where Bloomgard, the fellow that you just mentioned about the circulation for the radio substance, whatever it was, was there. And he was there for a bit and continued his work at MIT. And this poor woman, she could have become my mother, but she met my, uh, her future in-laws and said, no, thank you. Uh, and MIT had developed this research tool um, in 1949. It was lead-shielded Geiger-Buehler tubes on a framework encircling a patient. Poor lady looks like she's going to be electrocuted. Um, makes possible highly accurate estimates of radiation given off by radioactive iodine administered for thyroid disease. You might note here, my dad was a petite man. He was five feet four, and his pants were a little long here. He didn't have time to get them short, and he had other things on his mind, I guess. And I'm assuming that the radio iodine must have been in here, in this can of sorts. Anyway, um, so he went on to perfect radioactive iodine as a, um, a treatment for hyperthyroidism and, um, and cancer. Um, and this is a, a, a buddy uh, from New York uh, having his atomic cocktail. Love the name. <laughs> Um, as you mentioned, Dr. Seedler, Seedler? Okay. Um, he was interested in um, thyroid cancer. Um, my dad had administered the radioiodine to a thyroid cancer patient in the early 1940s before Dr. Sidlin had. However, it wasn't the type of cancer where the thyroid, where the iodine was actually taken up, so it wasn't effective. But after the war, his um, intent was to explore nuclear fission for a variety of cancers. And here is the announcement. He joined with his brother, my uncle Roy, who was also um, a cancer researcher, who, by the way, won an American award called the Lasker Award, which is a famous award in cancer. And so my uncle Roy, uh, Dr. Sedlin, and my dad, and a physicist uh, formed the Radioactive Isotope Research Institute, and they had facilities in Boston where my dad and uncle were, as well as New York where Dr. Sedlin was. And they went on to perfect the, um, the treatment. And as you can see noted, it is the first and the gold standard of targeted therapies. Um, I just want to uh, say something to you about um, patients. And um, that my, there were many, many patient letters in the boxes of materials that I found, and they were all very similar um, in that uh, people wanted to know how to get the um, radioiodine treatment, how much does it cost, because back in the days in the 1930s and 40s, there was no insurance money. So if you had an operation and you had to have your thyroid taken out, it would cost you two or $300. And the surgeons were very happy about this, but they were not too happy with Saul Hertz and his radioiodine treatment for $3.40. And guess what? You even got the orange juice. <laughs> so um, that was a typical patient letter. In the meanwhile, um, here are some famous patients that have um, been treated for radioiodine for Graves' disease. One of them is Barbara Bush, and my mom tried her best to get recognition from my dad, and Barbara Bush wrote to her. And for those who play golf, um, this woman golfer um, was number one in the ladies' ser uh, tournaments in uh, the United States, and having her thyroid problems, she went down to 109, but she got the treatment, and she came back on the circuit. And I just have one more, because I know I have to go line it up here. Um, I, I love this graphic. Um, this was in the American magazine. It was kind of like the peoples of the day. And in it, he says, the demand is expected for radioactive iodine as the research develops in the field of cancer and leukemia for other radioactive medicines. And just to, I have two things to sum it up. This is a... Um, photograph of an American track athlete, Gail Devers, who overcame Graves' disease, and she came back to win two gold medals in 1992 and 1996. All right, here's the summary. 
Uh, I tried very hard to have my dad receive the uh, appropriate honor that he deserves in that uh, the lovely Earl uh, uh, Chapman and uh, Robley Evans lived very, very long lives. They trained a lot of people, and they told the story the way they wanted to. And um, sadly, it wasn't until within the last five years that he's really gotten the recognition that he deserves. Thanks to one of your colleagues, Dr. James Thrall, who spoke at Mass General Hospital last spring. And uh, they t exposed you know, everything that had happened to my dad. Um, one of the patients wrote to me wanting to attend the conference, and uh, she wrote, treatment with radioactive iodine knocked the thyroid cancer, metastatic to a, a little bit of bone and lung, right out of me, exceeding my doctor's expectations. I am now 81. We have a large family. Many were pr praying for me. The cure delivered on the wings of prayer was Dr. Saul Hertz's discovery. The miracle of radioactive iodine. Get the motion. <laughs> Few can equal such a powerful and precious gift. And I think that says it all. <laughs> <laughs>